Welcome, everybody, to Who's Your Band? I'm Jeffrey Paul. I'm joined by Sean Morton. How are you, Sean? Wonderful, Jeffrey. I'm a beautiful shade of magenta from being outside for four minutes today. <laughs> That's <laughs> the Irish side of you coming out. That is 100% the Irish side of me. The, the Italian side was I had no food in my house and I panicked for four minutes. So I had to run out of my house to buy food. So that's the Italian side. Yeah, well, you'll you'll starve to death. I will um, <laughs> dick. <laughs> listen, we're going to get uh, started on this show. And we're going to start because uh, it's summertime. And summertime means big concerts, big tours. And uh, what we'll do uh, for, you know, for the remainder of the summer, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the shows that we've seen. And I'll start by talking about Friday night. Uh, I went to City Field and went to the stadium tour. And if you haven't, I mean, I don't know how you didn't hear about this, but the stadium tour is Joan Jett, Poison, Motley Crue, and Def Leppard. And it's 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 a it's a long day. It's a long day. It's a it's a it's a long show. Uh, Joan comes on at four thirty in the afternoon, which is a tough spot to do, and yeah. she's doing about fifty minutes. Right, um, the sun is at its highest too. Yeah, the sun, the sun is hot. Uh, but I got to say, for a 4.30 start time and you're the fourth band, uh, pretty good crowd. I would say uh, the, the park was filled up with at least 60%. By, um, yeah, by 6 o'clock, um, uh, what's the name? Uh, Poison comes on. And in my opinion, easily had the set of the night. And they're doing an hour. I'm hearing and, a lot of people saying that too, by the way. Yeah, they were gr- they were great. But they're also coming on at six. And by six o'clock, I'm saying the stadium is almost full. I mean, a lot of people come out to see Poison. And then I thought this was weird because on a tour like this, when you're 50-50, that's Def Leppard going on 30 uh, times last and Motley going on 30 times last. Uh, On Friday night, Motley came on first. Mm -hmm. And I think for a band like Motley Crue to perform 85% of their set in the daylight, that's kind of tough for them. Um, But the crowd was clearly, clearly there to see uh, Motley Crue. And they went on about 730 and, you know, they 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 put on a a pretty good show. Uh, But again, you lose a lot of it because of the aesthetics and the atmosphere. And then uh, Def Leppard goes on about 930. And by that time, you're a little burnt out. And I think if when you're on a tour like this with with three other bands, Everyone's pretty much doing their A set, their best hits, and bringing their A game. And Def Leppard really didn't do that. Uh, somewhere in the middle, uh, they wound up doing this weird acoustic set of redone tunes and some new songs, which is a tough thing to do as well. Um, and they kind of left off some some you know, some good songs as well. Um, but they were okay. Uh, but I think Poison clearly was the uh, act to see. So if you're going out to the stadium tour uh, this year, guys, uh, get there on time. Make sure you see Joan Jett, but absolutely get there to see Poison. What other concerts you have lined up? Uh, I don't know. I don't think I have too much. I have a lot. I'm on the road a lot this year, uh, especially for the first uh, month of the summer. In July, I'm, I'm on uh, I'm on the road just about every uh, every week, every weekend. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be it's gonna be a busy summer. I generally um, I generally lay back a little bit with the comedy in the summertime to actually enjoy more of the summer weekends, you know, as far as concerts and stuff go. I, I and then I get antsy when I'm not on stage. So it's like a it's a strange battle. We have to fight all the time. It is a strange battle. But um, hey, let's, let's, bring let's, get this, guest in. let's bring our guest in because, you know, I I reached out to this guy and I couldn't believe how fast he got back in touch with me and agreed to do the show. And I was really happy because let me, let me introduce him. Uh, this guy has coached with the Indianapolis Colts. He's coached with the Miami Dolphins. He's coached with the New York Jets, which I want to get in and talk to a little bit about. Uh, he finished his career with the New Orleans Saints. And there's some things I would like to talk about as well. Um, if he's not the best, he's at least in the top two best all-time special teams coaches, in my opinion, best special teams coach. Uh, I was a special teams coach at one time in my life, which was pretty cool. I'm so excited to bring out this guy. He has a new book coming out called Figure It Out, guys. You can get it on July 12th. Let's welcome into the show, Mr. Mike Westhoff. (laughs) Hey, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to correct you on one thing about that with my book. Uh, Yeah, it comes out everywhere July 12th. Uh, you know, Barnes and Noble or Amazon or whatever. But right now, 
And for the past month, it's been uh, available through the publisher, which quite a number of people have have done. Um, the publisher's mascot, mascot books. And you would go into mascot books, punch that up, and then put the title of the book in. Title of the book is Figure It Out. That's and right. And it'll deliver it right to your house. It's pretty easy. So it's, it's you can do it either way. But it comes out everywhere July 12th, but it's available at uh, mascot books right now. And if you guys know Mike, uh, Mike uh, is not a shy guy. And he, he's a, he's not the type of guy that's going to kind of like tippy toe around subject. He, it's going to be a great read. In fact, I was talking, I'm not saying this because you're on the show, but I was actually talking to someone today and we were talking about summer reading and your name and your book came up that people are excited to actually uh, read. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting it. Thank you. I'm proud of it. I think it's a good story. Uh, it took me about almost, uh, almost two years to write. It was a perfect time for me. It was during the pandemic, you know, so I, wasn't exactly like we all had a whole lot else to do. Exactly. And I had the opportunity. So I did it. It's a story I wanted to tell. And it's kind of a behind the scenes. Um, it's not the $160 million quarterback. It's the guy that came out of nowhere and figured it out. And we pretty much changed the game. And now it's it's changed back in a lot of ways because of regulations. But nonetheless, it was a unique time in football in the National Football League. And I'm proud to have written about it. Well, let's let's start with this. Um, see, I'm wearing a jet shirt. I'm I got big... you. I see. It's pretty great. I have okay. a Saints one on today. Though. I, I, saw, I, on. I saw that as well. <laughs> um, but this is where, where I wanted to start with you, Mike. Um, in 2006, why didn't you get the New York Jets head coaching job? That's a good question. Probably um, it was not. It just was no way it was going to happen. Uh, it wasn't even to be honest with you. I wasn't even close to tell you the truth. I interviewed. And I interviewed with uh, uh, Terry Bradway, Mike Tannenbaum, and Woody Johnson. Um, I was I, I was certainly well enough prepared, but it didn't make any difference. Mike had worked the deal. You know, he and um, Eric Eric uh, Mangini had been friends close when they were both up at Cleveland. That's right. And Mike was working the deal where Mike would become the general manager. Terry Bradway would move back into personnel, which is a, a move that would rival Houdini. Could make that move, <laughs> but that you'd have to look that up in another time. Uh, and basically, that's the way they wanted it to go. So even though I interviewed, I was, to be honest, to tell you the truth, I was really not a not a viable candidate. And I don't think anyone else was either, to be honest with you. But they uh, did that. And I was under contract. They didn't want me to leave. And I stayed. I stayed with New York. I had actually was I, I had a great time there. It was one of the best times of my life. I went to New York in 2001 and it was a great experience for me. And so um yeah, I wanted that job, but uh, no, I wasn't. To tell you the truth, I wasn't even close. Now, if I, I remember correctly, I, um, in the newspapers and on talk radio and just like amongst like, you know, the Jeff fans, a lot of the Jeff fans wanted you to get that job. Yeah, they were the smart ones. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted me to get to you want to know the truth. I could have I like it. I would have done it in a heartbeat. I did everything else I figured out. And, you know, don't forget, I, I coached a long time. I was 15 years with the, the Miami Dolphins. And I sat right next to Don Shula for a long time. Mm, not you know, you, a bad mentor. Learn, yeah, you learn a lot from a man like that. He was tremendous, tremendous football coach. And and I was and I was very close to him. Uh, I earned my way with him because nobody gets in with him for free. And he's, he was tough, but uh, he was very fair. And I learned a lot. So I think I knew the business and I knew how to do it. Uh, getting the opportunity, you know, you have to get it. So yeah, some fans... The, the, the stuff that I had, the kicking game became a viable part of the Jets' success. We contributed in every fashion, and we were really good. We were very good. Um, I believe we were the absolute best in the league, but, you know, I'm a little cocky when it comes to that. But one thing for sure, we were doggone good. We really were, and it was a lot of fun. And and I under and I got New York. I got the Jets. I got the fans. I loved it. It was one of – yeah. I, I lived in Long Island. I lived in Garden City, but I was right next to Hofstra where our offices were. I loved traveling in and out of the city. It was a great time. Uh, we were good. We were a good football team. We weren't quite as good as I think we could have been. Wait, but, which you know, we years were, are you talking about? We okay, I went there from my first 10 years there. We were really good from 2001 to 210. We were right, in a playoffs. You coached under three different coaches with the Jets. Yes, I was there with, with uh, Herman Edwards. I stayed through Eric Mangini, and then I finished up with Rex Ryan, and then I retired after I left there with Rex and I went back to work for the media and worked for ESPN and SMY television. I did that. But um, those were good years. We were a good team. We were in the playoffs a lot. 
you know, we went to two AFC championship games. And, Both under uh, Rex. Yeah, under Rex. And we were certainly um, not the quote unquote, same old Jets. We were not. We were a good football team. And uh, it was fun to be a part of and something I'm, I will always love and be very proud of. Well, what can you tell us a little bit about uh, having a 10 year? First of all, I think it's 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 not very often that when uh, a coaching change occurs that they keep uh, anyone really from the old regime. And you were there, like you said, for Herm Edwards, Eric Mangini, uh, Rex Ryan. By the way, the Rex Ryan staff was one of the best staffs I've ever seen uh, a Jet team have. Um, but what can yeah, you tell interesting us? interesting you know, that you say that. I'll interrupt you one second. Yeah. That's pretty intuitive on your part, to tell you the truth. John Gruden, who's a very good football coach, yeah, and at that time was working for ESPN. <laughs> he came in to visit us, and he and I became good friends. He told me that in his career, that's the best NFL coaching staff he ever saw. Well, didn't you have Bill Callahan as your offensive mm-hmm. line coach? Offensive line coach. Yeah, the guy was a tremendous offensive still, line still coach. Still head coach himself. Still is. Still right. Cleveland Browns. He's excellent. Anywhere he goes, you know they're going to run the ball. We, we were a good coaching staff. Anthony Lynn, who was the head coach of the Chargers, sure. coached our running backs. You know, Mike Pettin, who's been a head coach, he was with sure. us. Ben Kotwika was my assistant. He's been a coordinator all over. We were we were a talented, and, and we inherit, he, yeah, Rex inherited a good football team. We had the right type of team for Rex Ryan. You know, he believed now, in the offensive coordinator was who on that team? Just want to be 100% sure. Um, uh, Brian Schottenheimer. Okay, so this leads yeah. me to the, that question. We were going to run the football. Exa- there you go. Play there you pass. go. Because you know, the, a- the offensive line that you had, remember? Oh, the Brickershaw yeah. Ferguson, Alan, Alan Fanica, he's in the yeah, Hall of Fame, by the famer. way. Nick Mangold, Damian Woody. When we, we, we let, and, and by the way, our running back was Le, uh, LaDamian Tom, LaDamian Tomlinson. Right, so we, what do they want to the do Hall of Fame. to throw the ball? Well, well, you know, Mark Sanchez was our quarterback and no disrespect to Mark because we know what Mark was, but Mark could manage that football team. And sometimes that's enough. You know, was it Tom Brady? No, he's not Tom Brady. Come on. But yet at the same time, he did a nice job with what we had. And the fact that we had, we were very good on defense when we had Drell Rivas and we had all those guys. So that was Marty on that team too, right? Marty was on that team. Yes. And I had an all-star team, you know, I had, you know, Leon Washington running the ball back. I had, we were just good. And it was a good solid team that really nobody wanted to play because we were very, very physical and we were a tough team. We'd knock the heck out of you. And so uh, that's who we were. And, and we were good enough to get to those championship games. I think if we had stuck with it and it exemplified that realm of team, we could have gone pretty far. And all of a sudden, you know, we're going to become the new England Patriots South branch and we're, we're getting rid of Alan Fanica and signing Plexico Burr. So you tell me how you think that worked. I, I don't think it worked out at all. And Thanks, as a guy who also was an offensive line coach, I believe you win in the trenches. And those are the guys that, that are going to, you know, how you're going to win your games. Um, so let me ask you this. Tell us a little bit about the differences in Herm Mangini and Rex. I mean, you got three different guys, three completely different personalities, styles, you know, who, who was your favorite? Who was your least favorite? And to just no, can you tell us what it was like, like, like life was like with those guys? No, you know, I won't venture there with favorites. That's not, but here, I'll tell you, first of all, for me, it didn't make any difference. They all left me alone. None of them bothered me. That hell left me alone. I, I did my thing. I coached it. I was a coordinator. I made every call. I, I did it all. So no, but they didn't want me. They weren't going to let me leave. Uh, that was a smart thing that they did, frankly, to be honest with you. They just, so was, and I loved it. Um, Okay, uh, Herm's strength was as a former player. He had a very good way with the players. He understood them. He got that. He did. As as going in from to, to be a head coach, frankly, he was really not very well prepared. He had never been a coordinator. He had never been. A, he was assistant head coach, but you know he just sort of took bed check and that kind of stuff. That's what he did there. But um, he was good with the players, as far as clock management timeouts, things like that. He, that was not a strength of his. It just was not. Um, the draft, that was not a strength of his. He got that through. But what Herm did do, he let everybody kind of run their own areas and then he oversaw it. And he, he was very good with penalties and turnovers and things like that. And, and that helped us. I, I took charge of officiating and penalties and I spent a lot of time in New York in Manhattan at 280 Park Avenue uh, in the league office with Mike Pereira. And for eight years, we were the least penalized team in the National Football League. So maybe that helped us win some games. Uh, but Herm was good at that kind of stuff. That was the strength that he had. Um, 
the game management, the clock management, those things that that was not a strength of his. It just was not. And um, and and that hurt us at some times. But yet, you know, he inherited a good football team. You know, Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick know how to make a pretty good football team. And so we inherited a good team. We really did. This was a pretty good ball club. And, and we kept it going. We, you know, Vinny Testaverde was our quarterback. And then um, Chad Pennington came along. And so we had some weapons. You remember the receivers, you know, Lavernius Coles and Wayne Corbett, Santana Moss. I mean, come on, these are good players. So, you know, we were competitive um, and it was, it was a good ball club, but that was Herm's, you know, kind of his strength and his maybe not so strong. Uh, Eric was a, um, you know, a Bill, a Bill Belichick guy. And it's not easy to be Bill Belichick because you know, he, he's kind of his own entity. Um, but Eric, in a lot of ways, was very strong. His strengths were in organization, his understanding the game and practicing situations. He was very, very good at it. He understood it very well. And he did a nice job with that. He was not a great people person, to be honest with you. He, he was a little condescending and he stepped on some toes. It's a shame because I think as he went along, he matured and got better and better at that. To be honest with you, I don't believe he deserved to be fired after that season. Remember, that's when we went out and got Brett Farr. We got I, Brett I have questions about that. Yeah. Partway through the year, we're eight and three. I mean, we're eight and three and Brett Favre gets hurt and he couldn't throw across the street. That's right. Well, we lost, you know, we lost four of our next seven or four of our next five. And we end up at, uh, you know, we end up at nine and seven nine and, and seven. We got fired. We were out of the playoffs and we didn't get in and Rex. So, but Eric, that just the thing that he just didn't do very well. And he stepped on some toes. I think if, if he was good with me and if I had been with him a little longer, I think I could have leveled him off a little bit because he's a good man. And he Were you was able to talk coach. to him? Sure. Would, sure. Would he take constructive criticism? Yeah, yes, he would. Yes, he would. But, you know, he had his own way. And sometimes sometimes he couldn't get out of his own way. To be what honest. does that mean? Well, like what? you know, he, he believed in a certain style. He just had you know, and he just couldn't get away from it. You know, we practiced harder than we should have. We got more guys hurt in practice than we than we wanted to. He'd come into a, a meeting room. We'd have a game plan meeting. And, and, you know, and he wanted to make sure everybody knew everything. And he'd, he'd look at Mike Nugent, our kicker, and he'd say, Mike, tell me about their defensive line. I told him, I said, Eric, you ever ask me one of those questions in front of everybody? It'd be the last question you're going to ask in this damn room. So you don't make sure you don't ever do that. It just was embarrassing. He didn't, he didn't mean it to be hurtful, but it was condescending. And the guys, a lot of guys took things the wrong way. So did he have a problem with Revis with during yeah, that time he had as well? With everybody, he had problems. It just was. It wasn't as I said. He went from a point I think of maturity that needed to develop, and it did develop. It did. It just unfortunately. It, uh, and then he went to Cleveland. and He had the same type of problems, and it manifested itself there again. And he got out, and he's never gotten back in. And and I think he's a very good coach that deserved a chance to get. I agree. In. So and he drafted was, well, too, if I remember. Well, actually, he had a very good way of organizing and evaluating talent. He was excellent at it. I mean, we we had, we put together a good team. We put together a talented with free agents and, you know, undrafted guys. We were very good at that. And so um, it, it's in some ways, I think it's a shame that it ended up the way it did. I, I think he deserved a, a little longer chance. Would have it worked? To be honest with you, I don't know. I can't tell you. And then Rex came along. You know, Rex was a defensive guy. You know, his dad, the great defensive coordinator, Buddy Ryan, you know, with the Bears. You know, yeah. people still use that as an analogy. You know, if you're talking about a defense, you know, you say, well, they're not the 85 Bears. Well, no kidding. Nobody is. That's why. But the guys were pretty good. And so Rex was of that mentality. Rex, you know, believed in controlling the clock. He, he wanted to throw the ball only despairingly. He wanted to run the ball, control the clock, play defense, and, and he was very good with me. And so – you know, he had a particular image. It was perfect for that group of guys. It was perfect. The one thing about Rex that I think you should know, you know, a lot of his kind of craziness and the things that he got in the media that we'd hear about all the time, none of it, believe me when I'm telling you this, none of it manifested itself with the football team ever, ever. Rex did a good job around the guys. The players respected him. We had a disciplined program. We had a, it was a good no no but when nobody was late nobody missed practice everybody got it Rex was was real big at that, uh, do the right thing 
If you don't do the right thing, trust me, we're going to let you know about it. And then he was great with us. He was tremendous with me. I had a lot of fun working with him. He was fun, you know, and he was a character. Oh, he'd get fired up. Yeah. And he'd yell, you know, all right, let's go eat an effing snack. You know, that was Rex. He was, he was a character with that, but um, he had the right idea for the right group of guys. The fact that it got away, uh, he has to accept some of that blame. I think that's part of it. I don't know if he fought hard enough. You know, we had the, 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 the lockout. Remember that year they had the lockout. And that's yeah. when we lost. When we lose 14 guys. And, you know, all of a sudden, this good football team is just dissipating. Rex is, Rex is a, a firm believer in himself. And I think he believed he could make this work. But, you know, it's, you're just, it's not the same guys. And so it was different. I think if he had just completely stuck with what he believed and we kept going, we'd have been good enough. We'd have been good enough to beat anybody. Yeah. I mean, he, he was smart. Remember he brought over a bunch of guys from the Ravens. I thought Bart Scott was a, was a great, uh, was a great addition to, to the team. Cause he was kind of like almost like a coach on the field. I thought Jim Leonard was a very underrated very good. Uh, player. Very that they he was a good over. defensive coordinator at the university of Wisconsin. Exactly. Uh, he'll, so he'll be a head coach in, in college football any day now. Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 that was always the thing. When, even as a player, so he, well, when they got him, you remember it was kind of like on the downside of his career. But he yes. was so smart, I was able to kind of teach the defense to some of the Correct. younger uh, players. I, I always kind of like that. Um, why did Fav only last a year in uh, New York? It's a good question. I'm tell you the truth. I, I am. I'm not. I, I wish I knew, and I, I'm not 100 percent sure of that answer. I, I, you know, I don't know if he ever came with the idea that, you know, to, to get himself re to restart the engine and then move on to other areas. I'm not sure that wasn't part of it. I don't know the business end of the contract, so I can't, I can't tell you. And I, I just, I don't know that. I was always under the impression that, that he would be there for a while. That's what I thought, but I really well, didn't you trade know. for a guy like that. Yeah. You get, you want to have, that's for what like you think, years. but to be honest with you, there's a lot of those, that's better. You'd have to, You'd have to go with Mike Tannenbaum or something. Cause I honestly truly just don't know. I don't know. I wish I did. And I, do you think he was Payne fun to be Sanchez, around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, do, do you think paying Sanchez all that money was a mistake? Yes. No, I don't put it this way. That That's a tough. And I answered that a little quickly, but you know, that's just what I usually do. Um, <laughs> I asked Mike that one time I said, you know, he, I said, Mike, why did you redo Mark's contract? You know, he, he, we signed him to a very fair contract when we signed him. And his answer to me was, that's what a championship game quarterback has should be paid. I said, well, if he had something to do with us getting there, I'd believe that. I'd be right. with you. But he didn't. I said, he, he was on the bus. He was not driving the bus. He was on it, yes. But he was like eight rows back. He wasn't sitting up there in a driver's seat, believe me. Uh, and that's just so – but, you know, there's some of those business things that sometimes I'm not as surprised to – um, I, I don't quite, and I, I never really totally got all involved in all of that. Um, I believed that he was under a very fair contract and the right type of contract would have kept them there for a long period of time, how it got escalated like that. That's a very, very good question. And I don't have a good answer. Could anyone have a uh, quarterback that team? <sighs> wow. It's interesting. Could have anyone. You know, any, I'm, I'm, I'm I know what any, you're saying. Any, cap any capable I, quarterback. Put it this way: I think there's a lot of type of guys that are good, solid backup guys that could have been successful with that football team, because that was a team that controlled the ball. You had to have a certain type of passing. You know, you need to be a play action guy. You had to have a little running talent yourself if you could do that. That would help also. A guy that could get out of the pocket. Though, yeah, I think there are a number of guys who could have been successful with that uh, with that with that type of team. Hmm. Uh, switching gears a little bit here. Um, why was the uh, Adam Gaze era such a, wh why, why, was, why was his tenure so bad in New York? Don't know enough to tell you, to give you a real honest answer. I just don't. That's, that's you know, I was, I, I was working with the media and a lot of those things, you know, the, when you get into that, being out of it, like I was, I'm, I, I don't have the complete, you know, I don't, I don't feel comfortable to give you the type of answer that I'd like to give, because I'm just, I, I don't really know enough about that. It just never, it, <laughs> no matter what it was, it didn't seem to work. I don't know what they tried, whatever they were trying. None of them, none of it seemed to work though. The reasons why 
I don't know. I, I don't feel comfortable with that because that's just that's a little bit out of my bailiwick, to be honest. Well, let's go with something you, you, you may be comfortable with. Um, whose idea was it to bring in Tebow? Now, that's, you, you know, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I'm not really sure. I think it was Rex's. I think it was Rex. They, it. No, 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 I'm not kidding. I think I, I probably came through Mike and then it went to Rex. Rex called me. I know that he was on the road and he called me and he said, Mike, if we bring in Tim Tebow, what do you think? I said, no. He said, no, I said, tell me how. And he said, well, we're thinking about him in a real multiple talented and positioned role. He'll be like a wildcat quarterback. He'll run in and out of different positions on offense. He said, that's pretty innovative for that time, by the way. Oh, well, well, there were people that were using the wildcat. Don't forget the Miami made a big deal out of it back there. Right? I mean, the, the, uh, the but Falcons, anyway, but there were some still. teams doing it. But then he said to me, would you use them? I said, absolutely. I'll put them on my punt team and right. run fakes with them. Now, I'm the only one that kept my end of the bargain because no one else did it. Every, now, as competing as a starting quarterback, it's not going to happen. I mean, ask Bill Belichick. He let him go a couple years later. He didn't keep him as a starting quarterback. It, it just, just wasn't there. But in that other role, I think he could have done a pretty good job. You know, he gained weight. He got bigger and stronger. People have asked me to compare him to Taysom Hill. No, nah, forget about it. Taysom Hill's, I think, way better football player. Not even close, in my opinion. Um, but in that role, I think it would have been interesting what uh, Tim Tebow would have done. He was very good with me. And I, I, we had a ball. We ran a number of fakes, and we were good at it. Now, the one time I had to use him to block somebody, he couldn't block anybody, and they ran right through him. I wanted to kill him. But uh, I kept my end of the bargain, and no one else did. And I think that's that's very much uh, – when I was quoted as saying the whole thing, that was a disgrace. It wasn't Tim Tebow. It was the way he was utilized. And I'm, I think that was a really a miscarriage of what uh, of what he could do. And so the whole thing got blown out of out of perspective. It should have never come to that. I think if he had been used in that particular role, it would have been fine. It never. All of a sudden, he's you know lined up and taking certain reps as you know going against Mark. Mark, I mean, come on, it just wasn't there. He had a, a very slow mechanical throwing motion. It took him all day to get rid of the ball. It just wasn't there. And and did we ever use him in the other role? No, we did not. So I think that's a miscarriage. How did the guys in the locker room uh, respond to Tebow on the team? You know, that, that's a, differently, I think, than you would than, than you might believe. At first, at first, I think there was some animosity because, you know, this guy, you know, remember ESPN went and set up a whole, uh, you know, a big, a big trailer up there and had the Sal Palantonio and, and Hannah Storm up there every day that they actually helped me get prepared for a lot of media things because I would interview with them all the time and they were great to me because they knew I wanted to do that and they helped me with, 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 you know, working on the air. So they were tremendous to me, but, um, but now as it developed, as things developed and the guys got to know Tim, he gained a lot of respect. He worked hard. Did he ever gain the respect that he would be the starting quarterback? No, he, did he wasn't not. good enough. That didn't happen. And, and no, and everybody could see it. But what they did see was a hard working kind of football player in some ways that if, but we never saw him put into that role. It just never happened. They didn't use him that way. And uh, remember I used to, I used to say, Rex, Rex, when are we going to see him in that wildcat role? Oh yeah, we got it already. Yeah, ready for what? I don't know when, because it never happened. That was disappointing. Um, but as far as a guy that worked hard and was good in the weight room, and was a good teammate. I, I, I think for the most, and I can't, you know, I'm not in a locker room. I don't know exactly what guys say or think, but, for most, the most part that I saw, he seemed to earn a level of respect. Yeah, but if you have the problem, you you know, you, you, at, at, when you're with the team, you know what, what the problem is. Like you could you could sense it. But it sounds like Tebow was actually he he always came across as a good guy. He came across as to me, you know, I mean, from an outside, from what I read him and going to the games, he seemed like a, like a hardworking guy. He always kept himself in shape. Um, let's get back to you a little bit here. From when you started, Mike, uh, to today. How much has special teams changed? Well, that's uh, that's a really good point. That's a really good one right there. ESPN should call you up. Keep asking us. Please, questions. please. I want a new co-host. Let ESPN take him. I'm tired of him. He hasn't shut up in a half an hour. Continue. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I first got in the league as a coach, I, I, had co I coached defense in college. I did that for a long time. You, you were at Dayton, right? 
Well, no, as well. That's when I, that was my first, uh, when I, I was in Indiana as a graduate assistant, I was coaching defense with those guys. And I went to Dayton as an offensive line coach for a year and I coached the defense. So I went to Indiana state. Then, then I went back to offensive line at Northwestern. And so that's kind of what I was. I got in the NFL in 1982 with Frank Cush when he went to the Baltimore Colts. Okay. I was the strength coach, believe it or not. Uh, I was the tight ends coach. I was assistant offensive line. I was assistant head coach. I did all those roles. Uh, during the, remember they had, a, we played two games and the players went on strike. I was jogging in Towson, Maryland and came across Frank. He said, come on and walk with me. He told me, he said, Mike, I'm going to fire a special teams coach. And he went on and told me he just didn't like, thought he was terrible. I said, look, don't do that. I said, let him just stick with the defense and help them a little bit. I'll take special teams. Wait, so this was 82, you said? Yes, 1982. Now My in 82, year. okay, so was there, uh, were there special teams coaches or was it the assistant uh, coaches that was, all contributed? It, again, that's another good point. It was it was really pretty much, yes, yeah, sometimes there was one guy that kind of oversaw it, but it was a lot of ways divided amongst the staff. There really weren't, weren't really true often special teams coordinators. So here I'm going to coach it. Now, yeah, guys would help. You know, that's kind of, it wasn't, it, it was, it was minuscule. It was a minuscule part of the game. Yeah, it was important. And some coaches had made, had, had got a little bit of notoriety with it. Um, you know, George it's a third Allen, of the game. It's yeah, a it's third part of the game. game. It's not a third. It wasn't a third of the game. And actually, it, it is a was. third of the game because, because uh, there's a, cause like your special close. teams, when you had a guy like Brad Smith, Different okay. story. <laughs> okay. And, you're right. you had, and Liam Washington, there's a difference between starting on your own 20, 25 or starting on your own 35, 40. That's a huge part of the game. You're not on the field as much as the other two components we are. Had, we, we but had one the of, impact we had one of the is just as starting big. field positions. Uh, oh, the Bears, I guess, would rival me maybe my whole time at, uh, at uh, New York. But I'd have to, I, I still think we were right. We were first and, and they weren't second. We were really good. Um, anyway, make a long story short, here I'm going to become a special teams coach. What I learned in a hurry is that there was almost zero innovation. Everything was pretty much cutty cook, cut, or cookie cutter stamped. It really was. Right. There wasn't a lot of that. There was also, there was zero regulation. You could do anything. So what I did, I did everything. And I developed two very good philosophies. I wanted to be, a, so I started looking at my covers. And I said, okay, now I got to cover kicks. I had no notebook. The guy's notebook that I had, it should have come with crayons. It was terrible. The notebook was a joke. But I'm looking, I'm like, how am I going to figure this out? So I wrote mine. I started writing it page by page. And that, then I, I realized I want to get a philosophy. So I thought, okay, now I'm going to cover kicks. So who do I want? I'm on defense now. Well, I want a blitz. So I went into our defensive coordinator, Bud Carson. Remember, Bud was one of the all-time yes. great defensive coordinators in NFL history with the Steelers, the great steel curtain. I yep. said, Bud, give me the perimeters of blitzing. He decided he did everything for me, showed me how to create an edge, how to take guys in stack and look like they're going to two are going to hit the same gap, make one thing look away and make, make it actually be something else. He gave me this whole perimeters based off of blitzing. So I designed my kickoff coverage after blitzing. And, and when, that's back when you could move people everywhere. I mean, you could run guys everywhere and move them all around. And I think I presented more, co more problems with that than anybody ever did. We were really good at it. So then now, go ahead. I was going to say, how much film did you watch as a special teams coordinator? Well, first, I watched tons of film, but in a lot of those things, I watched zero film because nobody was doing anything. They're just running 11 guys down the field. No, but, you sudden, look, I, but, you, but you still, you're looking like for the weak link. You're oh, looking oh, you for watch, a, a, you watch a tons of ball. Well, you're getting into a game plan now. That's a whole different deal. Now you study every little thing. I studied everybody. I'd break anything. I'd watch hours. You just get in and you do that. But then on offense, I said, okay. Uh, I'm an offensive line coach, so I'm going to make my return, say a kickoff return. It's going to be an off tackle running play. I'm going to double team. And I mean, very specifically how we double teamed. So you have to read the book. You'll see how it's all drawn. I drew some of that stuff up. And we're going to trap. I'm going to set up a backside wall, just like an offensive line would do. The kickoff blocks are going to be my wedge and I'm going to be able to double anybody. I can double I used to, your number inside out. I could double to five, four, three on the play side. On the back side, I can dial five and four. And then I have a counter off of every play. But then I realized the thing that helped me the most is that being a special teams coach, I had a timeout before every play because right. I have time. So I drew everything and I got good at it. So now instead of having two kickoff returns, I'd have 12. 
I'd have 12. So I could sit in there and I'd hold this sheet up. And I'd say, all right, Sean, remember this now. This time now you've got to come around here and you'd know exactly what to do and exactly where to do it. And we set a pattern for the entire NFL. And that's what everybody started to do and took over. And that's why we were so good because it really worked. What did Let me you ask you one question. Okay, you, turn. okay, John. You always, you always hear about how hard the uh, New York media is now mm. that you've, uh, you know, you coached in multiple markets. Is it true that the New York media is a lot harder to deal with than other markets? No, that's it. I, I've always thought it was a little bit of a misnomer. I mean, there are times when I used to stand in front of some of them and, and wonder if they ever got picked in gym class. And so I wasn't just in exactly knocked out. But no, i tell you the truth, though. Here's the difference, the way I looked at it. I respect it. I, I just, I respected them. And even though when I wanted to kill them, I kind of still respected their job. And, and so for me, it was a matter of dealing with it. And so I, I never felt they were un, unfair, un, unharsh. I think the thing you had to be is just realistic. And don't don't try to BS them because they're not they're, they're they're pretty good at that now. They're going to see through that, and they do their homework. Though most of those guys are, are really pretty sharp. Though I felt that if I was just perfectly honest, and and I was as as honest as I could be, that I would have a way to, to get along with them. And I and I respected them. I absolutely did. Now there's some others that I didn't quite feel that way about, and I could be a little hard on them. And there's times when I was pretty tough on some of those guys. Um, but yet I, I respected their job. And I don't think I know. I think the me, the New York media is the first ones to tell you how tough the New York media is. I don't know if the rest of the world actually sees it quite that way. But uh, yeah, it's it's larger. You've got more people there that's competitive because, you know, you've got so many. You, know, you walk into a room instead of having two or three guys, you know, you got 15 and they're all trying to sell the pre- they're trying to sell the paper. You know, when you get on the subway, they want you to buy the post. And so, you know, that, that's how it works. And it's tough. So in that regard. Yeah, I think they are pretty tough, but I always felt they were fair. And uh, frankly, I, I respected most of them, and I still do. Mike, two more questions about special teams. Sure. Um, what did you look for in a kick returner, and what did, were you looking for in a wedge buster? First of all, wedge buster is a term and phrase I'll never use because nobody busts wedge. It's just the most Thank misused you. I agree 100%. Term in football. But here's the thing. When you go out, I'm going to tell a guy, why don't you go out on the highway why don't you go over on one of the, go on the George Washington bridge and run right into the front of the truck coming across. See how well you stand <laughs> up. That's what being a wedge buster is. You learn how to take a wedge on. You never hit right into a guy. You hit in between two, hit off the edge. It's all technical. There's no such thing as that. So what I look for in a special teams football player is a gym rat. I want a guy that can do everything. Plus the fact that he's got to be able to do it in the open space. A linebacker, right. He's a linebacker, but a lot of linebackers are great linebackers that play in the elevator. My guy's got to play in the lobby. He's got to cover everything. It's a different person. So you've got to be able to differentiate that as a coach. So you have to know this type of guy. So he might not be the biggest, but he's fast and he can move and he's agile. That guy can become the great special teams player. What position would he would he play besides special teams then? Almost everybody. Most of my real good guys came from uh, three positions. First of all, linebackers, defensive backs. I had a lot of success with DBs. Uh, yeah. they, those are the type of guys you can get everywhere. Occasionally, there'll be a running back. And then occasionally, uh, a type of wide receiver if he's physical. You remember, remember Brad Smith, eventually we moved him to wide receiver. And right. He did so many things well. The return guy, you like to have a certain speed where he can explode and burst. But I love to have uh, return guys that had the great talent. Now you're looking at two types because you got a punt returner that has to be such a gifted athlete. The best, uh, two best guys I ever had, I had OJ McDuffie in Miami and Santana Moss. I mean, Santana Moss was incredible. He had great hands. When he caught, he was sudden. That's the term I used to use. I mean, he would get it. It was boom. He's into the return right now. He was so quick that we could do things a little different. Could, Mike, could, I'm sorry. Could, could that be coached or was that just God giving it? Uh, no, he had, I didn't coach that one. His mom and dad had that one figured out. <laughs> okay. uh, no, he, he grew up with that. He was now over time. They do things and they develop these skills, you know, through how they practice and how they play and how they work at things. They get better and better at this, you know, like, like ke- catching punts. When I was young, I was fortunate to go to a training camp. Uh, when I was at Miami, we went up with the Atlanta Falcons. And remember the great punt returner, Billy White Shoes Johnson? Of course. He taught me how to teach guys to be punt returners. Taught me all the drills. We caught almost every punt in practice with one hand. 
You see, because if you get your feet perfect under a punt, anybody can catch with one hand, anybody. But if your feet aren't perfect, you can't reach out with one hand and catch the ball. So by doing it that way, you really learn how to get in perfect position or you can't catch it. So these are the little things. And I learned a million drills from him. So those are the things that you teach somebody and then you just practice and practice and practice until you get it perfect. The kickoff returner, you have all different types. Remember, I had Justin Miller. Now, I would set a wedge 12 yards from him, almost 15, because he wanted to run and chase the wedge. Leon Washington, five. He wanted to be right behind it, and he hid behind it. And then because it he, but, he was a smaller guy. Right. He was smaller, and he hid behind it, and then boom, he'd explode. He loved That's that. That's the guys I liked. You know, so it's up to me. The wedge, you know, high as far, as far as you can, and as soon as you see green, take off. Exactly. Now, Justin led the league, and he was really good at it, but he had it the other way. He wanted to chase it and then run through it because he was so strong. Though everybody's a little bit different, and as a coach – you have to really understand these differences and coach them and teach them, you know, where you're going to, the one I remember when I first got going with Leon, I was struggling. I thought I'm, I'm making a mistake. I got to get everything back tighter to him. Well, now I had the guys run almost right in front of the ball and stand there. And then we'd all run together. And then all of a sudden he'd come out of the pack. Next thing you know, he's running for a touchdown because he was really good. So that, that's a special thing. So, you know, every, you always have to look for a little something different in what you have. The key yeah. thing is, Improve what you have and don't worry about what the other guy has. I used to have a sign in my office that read, you can't win. You can't win with the other team. How they used to say it? What is the fact? You can't win. You can't, now, now I forget my own sign. Uh, yo, you can't win with the players you don't have. Right. You can't win with the guys you don't have. So quit worrying about it. Figure out who you have. I didn't have, I, I didn't have Devin Hester. I didn't have uh, guys, some guys like that. But I had nine when I was at the Jets. Nine guys that led the NFL in returns. I'll match that with anybody. I was gonna say you you did more with with the talent you had than any coach I've seen on the Jets, any position. Thank um you. how how did how do coaches yourself, other coaches, how do you deal with a guy that's big on talent but short on effort? Interesting. Big on talent and short on effort. Because, you know, the thing is you can't teach uh, and coach up talent, but it's got to be so unbelievably frustrating when you see the talent there and nothing happens. Like a guy like Vernon Goldston. I don't like there was talent there. What happens to a guy like that? I I would disagree with you there. You got to read my book. I'll tell you all about Vernon. Vernon Goldston did not have a great explosion. He He had a great career at Ohio State, right? We're not playing on Saturday. These guys play on Sunday. It's a different game. It's, it's just, that's what it is. It's just Thank different. You, I mean, if he, you know, you, you can be very, very good. You play Saturday afternoon. All of a sudden you come over there on Sunday, you can be pretty average. He was a, a great kid. He worked hard. He just didn't have that explosiveness about him. It wasn't there. It just wasn't How was he there. drafted so high then? But because he did, he, he clicked again. You should read this. And I'll tell you all about it. I can't clicked, wait to get this book. He clicked some of the boxes. I talked to Eric Mangini about him. And they, cause he's a good kid and he worked hard. Did he? But again, I do. I really believe that sometimes when you're watching that Saturday film, you got to make sure that you're putting it in the content of how they're going to play on Sunday. And I don't think he matched up with it because he didn't have that explosiveness. He didn't have that. And you, know, you need that guy that can explode. He was, you know, he was kind of rote. He was kind of a straight line type guy. You know, he looked great, you know, a big, strong guy. And he was a good man. He was a good guy. And he was tough enough. He just didn't have that talent, that that really explosive talent for that level of you know, seventh pick in the draft or something like sixth pick in the draft. And uh, you, you've got to be a little bit better than that. He would have been, to me, he would have been a good second round pick, a great third round pick. That's what he should have been. He just wasn't, he didn't have the talent, in, that, in my opinion. And uh, and I think I'm right, because that's where he ended up. Hey, do you think uh, Zach Wilson is going to be good? <sighs> I wish I knew him a little bit better. I wish I know. I, I'm not. I like a lot of things I see about him. I, I only I'm only watching him on TV, you know, just I'm not studying. Okay. You know, I'm not doing that. But uh, I think I want to see him utilized a little bit differently. I want to see him be a little bit variance in the offense. I want to see them get him out of the pocket a little bit better. You know, I want to see a little more creativity on their part. Now, again, you had a new coordinator. So I think he's, you know, he was feeling the ropes. We'll, we'll see how it's going to work. It'll be interesting. Um, a lot of a lot of things about the kid, though, I, I kind of like. So I'm rooting for him. So am I. One last thing. Uh, 
before we, we switch topics here is uh any you hear anything about Becton is 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 I, I can't figure this guy out because when I watched him at uh, Louisville and I was watching tape, this was the guy I wanted them to get. And I was excited when they got him. And I don't know what happened in the last uh, year and a half. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. I saw some, I, 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 I wish I knew I, you know, I'd, I'd have to be the training camp and study those things to give you a really good answer for that. I kind of agree with you. I saw a big window. And 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 I have not seen it. So the answers for it, I don't know. I, I don't study it. I'm not studying that guy. So unless I'm going to sit there and study him on tape, that's the only kind of I can give you. I'll give you a real good answer then. But when I'm not, then it'd be unfair for me. Yeah, because when I I remember when he, you know, that was the year you had four top uh, offensive linemen come out. They all went in the first. Uh, uh, I think they went in well within right. the first 12, right. 13 picks. And, you know, the Giants picked Andrew Thomas, who was considered the most NFL ready. And but I, I, what I liked about Becton was I liked that he had the nasty edge. And that's what I always loved about offensive linemen. You know, that, that you know, just, just like that desire, that nastiness, you know, that chippiness. And he, he seemed to say all the right things. And on the field, he he looked like he'd be a tremendous, tremendous run blocker. And in his first year, he was fine. So I'm so, sometimes I just wonder if in the NFL, the speed, the physicality, does that wear guys out uh, sure, a it lot does. faster? Sure, it really does. But yet at the same time, you know, that level of pick, he, he should be he should be a little better football player than he is. I could if I if I could go with him and watch film of him and watch him for three days, I'd give you a really good answer to that question. Because I know I know those guys. I can study it. And I just haven't done that. Um I'm with you, though. That to me seemed like that would be a really good pick. And that's very disappointing to me. They're going to have to you got to you got to find a way to get it done. You know that you mentioned that question about guy with lots of talent. I had very little patience with that. Very little. I mean, to me, I I was so tough on them that uh, there wasn't much of that. I didn't give them an inch to to, to even look if somebody was not going things the right way, because I would I would be pretty tough on them. Now, to, we've been, one, of, one of us was going to go home and it would probably be him. So that's the way I looked at it. Now we've been talking about for, for about 50 minutes here. And uh, this is very upsetting to Sean because he's, I think, a diehard Giants fan. Well, Sean, Damn. I'll tell you one thing. I'm, I'll tell you one thing that I like. I like the deep, the outside linebacker, the Giants drafted from Oregon. Whoa, oh, I think yes. that's, I think that's a home run in my opinion. That guy has as fast as two steps. I've watched on tape for a long time, in my opinion. And the game today, remember, the NFL game has changed. You know, this is like fast break football today. That's that's what the game is. It's get back and throw the ball. And, you know, it, it's not three yards in a cloud of dust. You know, it's not the game that Lawrence Taylor was an all-star at. This guy gets off that football and can rush the passer. Now, I think teams are going to try to run at him a little bit and see if he's strong enough and tough enough to play that. They're going to find out. But in the type of game that's accentuated in the NFL, I think the Giants have hit a home run there. I think that kid is going to be a real yeah, weapon. Thibodeau's going to be good, but he'll probably be gone in three years knowing the Giants. <laughs> I'm not going to – I don't know. I, I kind of like what they I, – I see some pretty good things that they've done there. I, I, I like the coach. I know him when he used to be with us and uh, – uh, I've got a couple of friends there. I, I think you've, uh, I think you've got some some pretty good future ahead of you. I could be wrong, but I kind of think you do. So we'll see. We'll what see you, what are you doing in your in your, your uh, retired life now? Since you've been in, in football for like forty something years on thirty well, something years. You on. know, I worked in the media for five years. Okay. I worked. You know, I had a radio show in New York, and I did SMY Television. Then I went back with the New Orleans Saints for two years. I went in seventeen and eighteen, and we were really good. I was part of a really good football team. And that was a lot of fun. And then after I got done and, and retired, then I wrote the book. I spent almost two years writing the book. Now, you know, I'm publicizing it. And I'm working on that. So I do that. And then um, you know, I live in South Florida, where I've always lived in Fort Myers. Um, I, I have a beautiful home here. And I do, you know, I, I work out, I ride my bike, I have a boat, and I like to fish. I go fishing a lot. I, I fish for sharks, which I wrote about in the book. I don't kill them, but I'm really good. We catch them. I'm good at it. We catch You're them. You're a fucking maniac. A little bit, yeah. I'm stay away from shark. What the, uh, like we don't kill them. We the let them go. You stay away from, and sharks are one of them, and you're actually going to go out and hunt one of them. Yeah, that's what I do all the time. Oh. I caught, I kept trying, I'm only trying to catch them over six feet, too, by the way. Only a Jets coach would do that. A Giants coach would stay away from the Sharks, I'll tell you that's that. That's why well, it's a lot of Jets fans are right now applauding if they're listening to you say that, because they feel pretty good about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm with those guys. I'm with them. So let's talk about, you know, because the show is called Who's Your Band? 
I know that's when I when when uh, my, the gal that helps me with the you know the social media told me about it. I said, "Are you sure you you sure?" She said, "Yeah, come on, give it a try." I said, okay, "Yeah, you don't try. realize we're doing this two and a half years. In the very beginning, it was like we do an hour show, hour and fifteen minutes. It'd be like an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes talking about music, and we've had episodes where we've literally spent forty two seconds talking about music." <laughs> if the interview is good, who gives a shit what the name of the, of the podcast is? As long as we're having fun and having a good time. Okay, well, I hope I hope I can help a little bit with that. You're doing you great, man. We we, we you, you tremendous. So you're you're a band that you uh, you know that's a little surprising. Huh? Big Stevie Nicks fan. Yeah, I'm, I'm a classic rock guy. You know, when I was young, yeah, I'm 74. Then when I grew up, you know, in the 60s, I, I I was a big Motown guy. Of course, you know, I love Motown. I I thought that was the greatest. And then, but then I really became a classic rock guy. So I'm I like all the all the classic bands and the those guys. So I'm I'm not a hard metal guy. Now that's not me. But the classic rock, Stevie Nicks, the you know, you go all the Rolling Stones, the, you know, Bruce Springsteen, all those kind of guys. Come on, I'm a big fan. I I love that stuff. I love it. Awesome. Do you get out the concerts? I've I've gone to a number of them. Um, the, actually, actually, we went to one down here. They have, you know, some of the, the, the we've had, they're kind of popular here in Florida, kind of the cover bands, you know, they're the, sure. the, the, the Stevie Nicks imitators. And mm -hmm. oh my goodness gracious. I went to two of hers last year, this gal. She was tremendous. I mean, I was all excited. I thought it was great. So that was fun. I've been to some pretty good concerts in my life. One that I'm proud of that I got to see, I saw Elvis Presley. When he was really, when he was really at his oh. prime, and it was great. He was, he was really good. That's all, that's mean, a great prime, like in his like late sixties. Well, no, no, I saw him. Um, I saw him in nineteen. It would have been seventy. I'm going to guess seventy three or four. It okay. was around that time when he was. He was good though. He was good. You know, he wasn't oh. heavy or big or anything. And he was. He put on a great show. Though you know, those are the types. I saw the Rolling Stones live. I've seen those guys. Uh, so I've seen my share of some pretty good ones. Not you know. Uh, Johnny Cash back in the day. I thought that was kind of cool. Wow. I just remember seeing him. And so, you know, I, I've seen my share of uh, pretty good, but I'm not, I was on Johnny uh, Cash's tour bus one time and I tried to steal something and I was trying to steal anything that I possibly could, but <laughs> everything in the tour bus was shellacked down with about an inch and a half of clear coat on top of everything. There was an ashtray. I tried ripping that off. I couldn't do it. Everything was roped off. <laughs> Almost broke my throat. Johnny Johnny Cash, a pretty big dude. <laughs> well, he's been, he was long dead before when that happened. It was, outside, oh, I got you. Okay. It was outside the uh, rock and roll hall of fame at the time. Oh, okay. No, but that's, you, that's the music I like. I, I'm a fan. Yeah. It's great stuff. And those tribute bands are really good. I saw one yesterday. I saw a Pearl Jam tribute band and that's a hard band to, because he's got a very unique voice and they were spot on. Absolutely yeah. spot on. It's fun. I, I, I enjoy going to those. I enjoy that. Yeah, very cool. Did music play a big part in the uh, in the locker room during practice? Did they blast music during practice? That's a, some it, no. It, it in the locker room, yes, of course. On the practice field, um, it, it's become more popular as of late. Um, what we what we did is we would really blast it when we were uh, in different periods to help prepare for crowd noise. You know, to where you almost couldn't hear, and you had to do everything with hand signals, things like that. I was over two weeks ago at the Miami Dolphins practice, one of their mini camps. And from the second they went on the field, the entire practice, the music was blasting. What are they right. playing? It, it was, it was, uh, it, 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 it was kind of a, uh, you know, I don't know what to exactly call it. Uh, you know, loud, hard, um, you know, i be honest with you. It wasn't my kind of, I didn't, it, it, I thought it was terrible to tell you the truth. And it was just blasting. Um, I thought it was terrible. It, it, because you couldn't you couldn't communicate, which is OK for a particular period. You know, you have a 12 minute period. OK, but you, I don't know how you could teach. I was standing there with Dan Marino on the sideline and, you know, I used to play for, for with me or for me. And, and I know he's one of my really good friends and we couldn't even talk at all. And so and I and I was disappointed, to tell you the truth, in the practice. And I'm thinking there's no way this would happen if I were there. I wouldn't I, I would not hold to this because I want I want to communicate. I mean, I want to, you know, if I'm, we're going to run a, a particular return and I want that double team on the 22 yard line and it's on the 33, somebody is going to hear about it. Now they can't hear about it with this music being blasted. So I, I thought it was, uh, I, I didn't really like it in that regard, but sometimes now there used to be a thing, you know, a lot of the rap stuff was big and I'm not into that. You know, I'd let guys know, you know, sometimes they'd be, they'd be blasting the music, you know, when they come into my meeting or something and 
I'd say, yeah, you guys, we're, 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 we're not having that on, you know, and they, they kid me and tease me about it. And I said, you know, I, I said, I have a really nice looking girlfriend. I drive a Mercedes and I'm going out to dinner. This music's not going to be on in my car. Trust me. You know, I'm not going to hear about what you're going to do to this guy and throw him over the bridge. So forget about it. I'm not going right, to ask you a person. Let me ask you a personal question. Girlfriend, a lot younger. Uh, a little bit. Yes. How, how much? How much? 15 years. Fucking love you, Mike. I fucking love Mike. <laughs> But who wouldn't want to have Mike's life? He had, a 50, he, had, he had a young girlfriend. He has a Mercedes. He still has his fucking hair. Come on. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I, I've gone through my share of rough times, though. You read the book. I've oh, I, know. I am reading this book. Let you me tell that. you something. I am reading this book. I've had my share. That I've give, us the, uh, give us the title of the book again. So Figure can... it out. That's the title. Yeah, Figure asked, it out. I asked you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the title of Figure It Out, which is what we did. I was able to do it. I took a group of guys that, uh, you know, not 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 the not not the high, the most sought after guy coming out. Maybe a guy that nobody knew about, but yet I saw things and we developed them, and I uh, turned into a heck of a football player and and helped and helped change the game. And that to me uh, was something that's the most important thing in my life. You Are you very active on social media, Mike? Well, I, I'm not. I knew nothing about it, to be honest with you. And then a gal that uh, helps me works for Merrill Lynch, actually, and helps me with my finances. She had a good has a good friend, and they read the book. And she said that she wanted to meet me. She had been in advertising her whole life. So I said, sure. She came over to my house about six weeks ago, and said, um, I can help you. I, I can help you. She said, I'm I, I'm really no social media. She said, I can push a button, and thousands of people will know. She said, I'm willing to bet you can't even find a button. I was probably pretty smart about that. <laughs> I probably couldn't find the button. So uh, she's really helped me with all this. And kind I'm of sure you found I'm of, sure you found the button, Mike. If you got a girlfriend that's 15 years younger than you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the, the girl you're referring to, is that Denise? Yes, yes. Denise yeah. is the gal that helps me. I she's very, you, very good. She's she's incredibly professional. I, well, thank you for saying that. I'm going to tell her that because I think she's we've made a, a nice deal between us. And uh, I sat here with her husband uh, the other night and uh, they're they're really good people. And they've been tremendous to me because this is a part of this business that I knew absolutely nothing about. And like any other business, you know, you have to you have to learn a few things. And so she's really helped me. But she she, cool. she did a great job. I mean, I, I know we had a little bit of a scheduling conflict. She was right on top of it. You know, I think when you surround yourself with good people, I think, you know, it, it does come back, you know, tenfold sometimes. I wouldn't know about that, Mike. Look who my co-host is. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Your co-host asked some pretty doggone good sports questions. Yes. I'll tell you what. Yeah. We'll go through, we'll go through I, spurts, I'm, Mike. I'm not being, I have, you know, I don't have anything to gain. I'm not, I'm not trying to. To do anything. I, I'm just telling you, though, I've done a gazillion interviews in my life, and there's a lot of good questions. And so he certainly knows. No, he's he's all right. Yeah, he's all right. You know, I mean, <laughs> he's okay. I, don't, I won't go too far. I don't want you to. No, you he's to okay. Well, that. you know what it was? You know, he knows a lot about football. He went to grammar school with Vince Lombardi. So it's been in his blood <laughs> since. <laughs> Yeah, I, lo I, lo I love I love the game. And when we found out we had the opportunity to interview you, I was very, very excited. And like I said, you know, I, I'm 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 a special teams guy at heart. When I played, I played on the special teams. I coached special teams. Um, uh, I wound up being, a, you know, I, not the same trajectory as you, obviously. I wound up coaching offensive line and then, uh, you know, uh, doing a little bit of head coaching. But I lo love, love the game. Um, but the um, the book is called Figure It Out. You can get it everywhere, everywhere on uh, July 12th, which is, you know, by the time this is uh, released, you know, it, it, that should be just around that time. Yeah, so, guys, absolutely. Yeah, please just check out this book. If you're a football fan, if you want to know what's going on. And, and the thing is, from what I understand, it's not an overly long book. There's about maybe, maybe 400 pages in it. Yes. Yeah. There's a few drawings. It's it covers a lot of different things, parts of my life. There's some there's some medical things in it. I've had a lot to do with that because I had quite a few adventures in that, to say the very yes, least. You did. But um, it's, it's I'm, I'm proud of it. And the thing that I think we did a nice job of, I wrote every word. But I had a writer, a guy named Barry Wilner, and, and, and so we interviewed a lot of guys. And I set it up, but then he would conduct the interview. I didn't want to interview the players. So you're going to hear me tell the story, and then you're going to hear Leon Washington tell it. And I, I think like that's that. it. I like that because they may hold back or 
it, it, I, I like that I like the idea. I, I really did it, do. and I'm and I thank you for saying it. I'm I, and I was very clear to them that I would not edit or challenge one thing that they said, and I actually did not read. In uh, what I did, I would send them material, then he would take pieces of these interviews and insert them different places where they were applicable. And I didn't see them until they were in the printed form. I didn't read them. So I did, oh, whatever great. the guy said, and it's in their language. So trust me, it's, it's X-rayed in a lot of spots now. We 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 we, we talked just the way they did in the locker room. So, um, but it was really fun to do, and I think it gives it gives the book a realm of a, a realm of uh, credibility that I think a lot of books don't have. And I, I'm proud that we did it that way. Well, like you said, it's not going to be a cookie cutter book. Um, is there going to be a book tour? Are you can do signings anywhere. Yeah, I'm going to try, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to learn of what I have to do. And I, I know I'm going to come up to New York. I want to try to go to their training camp, but I, you know, I've got some good friends at ESPN there. I'm going to go on with those guys. I'll go over to SMY and I'll do a lot of that. And then whatever book signings are, or, you know, or, or, you know, uh, I'm not Ernest Hemingway. I know that. I understand. But so whatever that that works in the right way, I'll be more than happy to to, to do any of that. Got a good place for you up here in Jersey. I'll make sure that Jeff sends it to Denise. You'll you'll pack that place. Well, I'd be happy to do it. Thank 10 you. Ten minutes I'd from ten minutes from MetLife Stadium, so you, you're going to have a lot I'd, of people. That's a good. That's thank you very much. Please let her know. I'll certainly do it. Absolutely. Yeah, and we'll Sean and I'll be there to get, get the, the copies of the book signed by you. No, I'd be happy to do that. It'd be fun to do. It'd be fun to talk about it. You guys are fun to talk about, to talk with anyway. So it's it's an enjoy, enjoyable subject. I think it's a good subject and it braces, you know, it, it, it ventures into a lot of areas. And I think it, it's a good sports story. And we could use a couple of good sports stories because we have enough bad ones. And this is good. True. These are good guys. Guys, get the book, figure it out. Uh, Mike Westhoff coming out July 12th and you, and we have the publisher if, if in case this comes out a little early, it's mascot, get it. it's mascot books there in Washington, DC area, mascot, M A S C O T. You can go into mascot books today, punch in the title, figure it out. It'll deliver it to your house in a couple of days. Awesome. Easy. Awesome. Mike, thank you so much for joining us, man. We really appreciate your time. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. I hope to see you. I hope to come up to Jersey and you hang will. out. It'd be fun. We will. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, Hang out and you can bring your 26 year old girlfriend and we'll, have, uh, we'll, go, out, we'll go out to dinner. 26. That's the, oh, give you give me in trouble with that. Now. That's the <laughs> we'll, plan, we'll, Mike. That's the plan. We'll, <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Thank you right, very guys. much. You're welcome. Take care, everybody. We'll catch right. you next time. Bye.